external examination of the genitourinary tract. We may consider palpation of the kidneys and ureters, palpation and percussion of the bladder, rectal palpation of the prostate and seminal vesicles, etc., palpation of the penis and urethra, palpation of the scrotal contents. Palpation of the kidneys, position of the patient. The patient with back and abdomen bared lies upon his back with his knees drawn up and his hands at his sides so as to relax the abdominal wall as much as possible. If examination in this position proves unsatisfactory, the patient may be turned upon the side opposite to that which is being examined. Lying thus with knees well drawn up, the kidney is sometimes more palpable, but as a rule, this is not the case. Palpation of the abdomen with the patient erect, but bending slightly forward, may reveal renal mobility that otherwise escapes observation. But many patients cannot relax the abdominal muscles while in this position, which is therefore but little employed. Position of the examiner. The examiner sits or stands next to the side to be examined. The operation. If the kidney is very large, its outlines may be determined by abdominal palpation. Yet it is almost always necessary in order to avoid mistakes to employ lumbo-abdominal palpation. Lumbo-abdominal palpation is performed as follows. To examine the right kidney, the patient lies as above described at the edge of a couch beside which and to the right of the patient, the examiner sits. With the index and middle fingers of the left hand, the examiner now identifies and makes pressure upon the triangular depressible spot below the last rib and just at the edge of the thick spinal muscles. The right hand is then placed on the anterior lateral abdominal wall, about an inch external to the linea semilunaris, with fingers directed upward and their tips just below the free border of the ribs or of the liver if this be enlarged. This hand is pressed down as firmly as possible, taking advantage of the relaxation of the parietes between inspirations. Blottiment. With the hands thus placed, the examiner may or may not feel a mass between them. In either event, he gives a quick, sharp tap to the loin with the fingers of the left hand. The result of this is twofold, viz. Number one, it may elicit costovertebral tenderness. Deep tenderness confined to the region just below the ribs and external to the erector spinae muscles is almost conclusive evidence of inflammation in or about the kidney. I have never known myositis to cause tenderness in this region. Number two, it may elicit renal bilotiment. This is the sensation comparable to fetal bilotiment imparted to the fingers depressing the anterior parietes when a sharp tap from behind throws an intra-abdominal body against them. Bilotiment should be attempted first during normal respiration, then with the patient breathing deeply, just as the abdominal wall relaxes at the end of the inspiratory effort. Renal bilotiment discloses the presence of a movable mass in the loin. It does not prove that mass to be a kidney, nor, if kidney it be, that the organ is diseased. One may obtain bilotiment from a mass of tubercular glands and from a neoplasm or corset lobe of the liver. Yet, as a clinical sign, bilotiment is most useful. When the kidney is normal in size and position, bilotiment can be obtained only if the patient is very thin and the abdomen very lax. But when the organ is abnormal in size or mobility and this abnormality is but slight, or when examination is impeded by fat or rigidity, bilotiment may be the only clinical evidence of this change. Thus, bilotiment of the kidney reveals slight enlargement or mobility, though other signs must be depended upon to prove that the mass felt actually is kidney. Palpation. In many instances, the mass, while large enough to be felt very distinctly by bilotiment, escapes every other method of lumbo-abdominal palpation except the following. The patient is instructed to take repeated deep breaths, and as he does so, the examiner gradually insinuates the fingers of his right hand deeper and deeper under the ribs, 
until at a propitious moment of post-inspiratory relaxation, rather sudden and sustained bimanual pressure distinctly catches the lower pole of the kidney before it slips back under the ribs. Considerable enlargement or mobility of the kidney is better studied by simple bimanual palpation. The mass is readily felt between the hand on the loin and the hand on the abdomen, and palpation and percussion are employed to outline its shape, size, and mobility. Percussion. A dull or flat percussion note is obtained over the kidneys, but the presence of the liver and spleen immediately above the kidneys renders this sign of little value. Differential diagnosis by palpation. Palpation of the unenlarged kidney scarcely ever affords evidence as to the exact nature of disease in it. Nephrotosis is diagnosed by palpation and a tender kidney is usually an inflamed kidney. Perirenal exudates are sometimes characteristically diffuse, but with these exceptions, palpation usually reveals little more than the fact that a mass in the loin probably is or is not of renal origin. Retroperitoneal and adrenal growths cannot be distinguished from renal enlargement by palpation. The enlarged kidney usually forms an ovoidal movable mass in part concealed under the ribs, rising and falling with respiration, palpable by lumbo-abdominal palpation or bilatement. But when the kidney is greatly enlarged or displaced and enlarged, it may be a delicate matter to distinguish the resultant tumor from enlargement of liver, gallbladder, spleen, or pancreas. The kidney is more lateral in position than any of these organs and more readily distinguishable by lumbo-abdominal palpation. Insufflation of the colon may be of use in differential diagnosis. On the right side, the hepatic flexure covers only the lower pole of the kidney, but is adherent thereto by the nephrocolic ligament of long year. Hence, if the kidney is greatly enlarged, it carries the hepatic flexure forward in front of it, covering its lower extremity. Most other growths reach the abdominal wall distinctly above and to the inner side of the angle of the colon, e.g. gallbladder, pancreas, pylorus, but enlargement of the right lobe of the liver descends external to and in front of it. Thus, the only tumor whose lower end is likely to be covered by the hepatic flexure of the colon is a renal tumor. On the left side, the transverse colon crosses in front of the lower third of the kidney and the descending colon lies external to it. But the lack of any definite attachment between the two organs permits the enlarged kidney to slip out from behind the colon. When the left kidney is sufficiently large to reach the abdominal wall, no hollow viscous intervenes. The descending colon borders the inner side of the mass. Enlargements of the spleen, on the other hand, reach the abdominal wall above the transverse colon. The ureter catheter. Inasmuch as disease of the kidney either impairs the secretion of that organ or alters the shape of its pelvis long before it produces a palpable tumor, the main dependence in diagnosis is upon the catheterization of the ureters. A study of the urine thus obtained, confirmed if necessary by pyelography and the wax-tipped catheter, affords an accurate diagnosis with which the findings of palpation must be made to conform.